Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. All right, hey everybody, welcome to episode 272 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyle, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation. I'm your host, Anthony Renner. The show notes are located at continuefit.com. It's also where you can find out more about all my resources, as well as my new book, Be Like the Best, and the Be Like the Best Workbook. The book consists of 50 interviews with top fitness pros, and after each interview is a Be Like, which is just an action step or a challenge that'll help you be like the best. You can see all that at continuefit.com. All right, today we got a special episode. We just have Coach Boyle on, and it's going to be the shrinkcoach.com Coach's Corner. Just a reminder... You can try strengthcoach.com out three days just to buck. You'll have access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best forum on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day. Check that out at shrinkcoach.com. So I wanted to get Coach Boyle on just to do a, like an overview. So some of the stuff you'll have heard and uh, already. And then uh, today we'll also try to jump into some new stuff. So Coach, how you doing? You know, Ant, I've been on my hands and knees for uh, a uh, over a week now installing hardwood floors, so I'm a little sore. There's a there's an unusual answer for you. Yeah, it's a good sore though, right? <laughs> it's a good sore. It is. I am actually returning to my carpentry roots. It is one of the few things that I really enjoy. I enjoy working on my computer and I enjoy carpentry in addition to strength and conditioning and eating and drinking. So uh, I'm a pretty uh, I'm a pretty broad person when you really think of all my interests. I was going to say, very well-rounded. Uh, ice cream, beer. Renaissance, Renaissance man. There you go. Um, Coach, this year at the winter seminar, you're going to be doing, uh, really, again, you know, not just for the people who listen to the podcast or on traincoach.com, because we do talk about some of these things a lot, but um, all the things you've changed, really, probably over the last, like, you know, two years, um, a couple of them, we've talked about kind of the different, like using the sled push as a uh, strength exercise, some different sp- uh, sled sprints and trap bar jumps. Now you've been doing for power. We talked last episode about quantifying power, how you're really trying to focus on that as well. Um, one thing you've added is new, not the non-motorized treadmills. Talk to us about why you're doing that. Well, it's interesting. I've, One, I've always said, being in the Northeast, we are forced to run inside for a large percentage of the year. So that meant we had to run on treadmills. Uh, I would say, I I always had probably underestimate these things, but probably 10 years ago, we bought a bunch of really nice woodway treadmills. And it was right about the same time that initially then it was woodway started to produce the uh, the curve, the non-motorized treadmill. And I remember thinking, darn I wish I'd gotten all non-motorized treadmills because one of the big drawbacks, obviously, to treadmill running is the idea that you don't really – you just have to keep yourself up in the air. You don't have to be the motor. You're not moving the belt yourself. And then all of a sudden, these guys started coming out with a lot more of the – a lot different versions of the non-motorized treadmill. And I started thinking, wow, I really need to start to look into this more deeply so – I actually got a couple to uh, to play with, and it ended up where we were. The one we liked was the the true form one that Perform Better is selling, and uh, so now we're going to get three of those, and we're going to do basically um, all of our interval stuff will be done on the non motorized treadmills for our athletes. We'll still let our um, our regular folks, whatever. Um, you know, run because it doesn't really matter as much for them if they're running on a motorized treadmill as long as they're kind of getting their heart rate up and moving. But for for the athlete population that we're dealing with, it really does make a difference that they're pushing. And you think about what we're thinking, you know, we're doing now with pushing sleds and sled sprints and all these things that we're trying to do. It's all about kind of pushing and hip extension. And then you get the treadmill where it's like, okay, I just kind of get on here and keep myself suspended and I'll be all right. So that's, 
Again, that's the long Mike Boyle answer to the short <laughs> Anthony Renner question, as well, usual. <laughs> uh, and that makes my job easier, so I, I really appreciate those long answers. Um, <laughs> Mike, what, though, how does that work in terms of, like you were talking, we were talking earlier, uh, like you're, you're starting to set speeds based on your 10 times, but with the, I, I'm not familiar with the non-motorized treadmill, so, like, I've never actually used one. Um, so, are they just getting them on them and then sprinting and then you can see what their time is or how, exactly. how does that work? Okay. We do the same type of intervals in terms of we might do 10 20s or 15 45s or whatever it is. But what we were running into, so the, the, the problem that we had, cause I played, you know, I, I'm always my middle school. Well, actually now my high school, freshman high school kid group with my son and his friends is always kind of my test area now. And I got those guys on there. And of course, what do they do? They try to figure out how fast they can run on the treadmill, and they basically almost fall off. So <laughs> you start thinking, all right, I need to be able to say, all right, I want you to run 15 seconds at X miles an hour. So what I did is I started looking, and I think it was Tony Holler that's – no, it was actually Ken Clark sent me a, um, a conversion chart basically where you were converting 10-yard time to miles per hour. So if I could look at this and say – Let's just say, let me see if I can pull one of these up. I don't know if I can, but um, because it might be in Adobe. But uh, let's just say that, as a for instance, one of our kids runs a 1.510, and that means that he's running 16 miles an hour. Now, don't hold me to the 16 miles an hour because I'm not sure exactly because I don't have the chart open in front of me. But um, with that thought, I could then say, okay – we're thinking now we're kind of Charlie Francis and we're talking about, Hey, we don't want our kind of tempo stuff to be more than 75% of our top speed. So we're just going to take, we're going to, we made up a chart and actually I can probably, that's what I can do. I can pull up the charts. I've already done the chart. So I just did a simple Excel chart where I converted, I put in the miles per hour and I put in the speeds and then I just put in what 75% of that would be so that, we could very easily look at somebody and say, okay, I want you to do 10 seconds at 12 miles an hour and that's it. And then now suddenly we don't need to have that kid running till he falls off. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, 1.5 is actually 13.5 miles an hour. And then there, you know, 80% would be, um, 10.8. So 75% would be about 10, uh, give or take. So, Okay. 10.125 to be exact. Okay. So this way we can look at kids and say, okay, we know their 10 time. And we then now we know what their speed should be for their conditioning. And we can do that very, very simply. Now, it's interesting when I said most people, what I found is that empirically, we kind of always end up in the right place. Because we tended to say to people, yeah, get on at 10 miles an hour and run. And that's pretty much kind of if we look at what our average 10 time is, it tends to work out. But if, as kids get faster, like a 1.4 guy is going to be basically needing to run at almost 12 miles an hour, 11.6 miles an hour. So because they're going to be going, you know, topping out about 14 and a half. When you start looking at some of these guys like, the, you know, Tony Hall has got some guys running 20 or over 20 miles an hour. These are people that are going to have to run 16 miles an hour or 15 miles an hour on the treadmill to, to have it be effective. Yeah. So you're starting again. The the you're using data, but it's got to be done in a way that logistically it makes sense. It's easy to use. You're pulling up this chart. Here you go. This is based off. So you're being able, you're able to use the data and individualize, but at the same time, s- sticking to your kind of philosophy of it's got to work logistically. You know, we exactly, and that's what's interesting is that I think we've always used data in the sense that probably from the time we could get a computer and start figuring out Excel, we've used data. We've used our, you know, at the the old days we were using our one RMs and creating programs based on one RM. So I think I'm, I kind of become, I end up seeming more anti data than I am because I think some people just end up too immersed in the data and not immersed enough in the, the sort of coaching and the logistics and a lot of that stuff. So it's, um, it's kind of like we, we talked about on that internet credibility article the other day where I think you've got some of these data people. you got a lot of, you know, this 
It's almost like the data people and the research people are more prominent now because if you're good with data and you're good with research and you can tell people about research and about data, then everybody thinks you're smart and they put you in charge. And that's not necessarily going to be true. You, you may be smart, but you may not know anything about people or coaching. And generally, I, I, I hate to say it, but usually people that are good with data and computers are generally not really good with people. They're, they're not sort of, you know, they're not the type of skills that you look at and think, oh, these skills go together. So um, I guess that's what makes me sometimes seem like, oh, I'm on the, I'm on the anti-data side too. Because it, it can, if you're a geek, it can fascinate you. And that fascination, I think, can sometimes lead to you getting maybe a little bit lost in the minutia. Yeah, and I think, you know, you had, like, the, the, the article, just to go back to the article, Assessing Credibility in the Internet Age, we posted on the, or reposted, you kind of updated it. You know, it's just, like, asking those seven questions uh, about that person who is, like, if they are talking about this, that has, has, are they consistently making a living coaching or training people? What do they do uh, every day? Do they sit at a computer, write articles, or are they working in the field? Are they making money by telling you how to coach, or do they make a, uh, a real living? doing what they're writing about uh there are some things that we could still kind of because there has to be where that middle right where it's that's that that where the rubber meets the road right bridging the gap that's this whole idea <coughs> exactly excuse me and i think that's the difference i think we're moving in some ways in the direction that a lot of big businesses have moved and a lot of schools have moved in places like that where people are going to be in charge who are not really good practitioners and they're going to be in charge because Again, smart people like to be around other smart people. So if you're a general manager and you've gotten to, to be the general manager because, like I said, you went to Harvard or Yale or some Stanford, you know, some exclusive school and you're really smart, you tend to be impressed by other people with advanced degrees who understand computers and who can show you all this data and say, oh, look at all the data. But the reality is, and I go back to this all the time, Sports strength and conditioning is a people business. It is not a data business. We are not, we're not selling or marketing something. We're not selling computers. We are training human beings every day. And so some, a really data driven guy sometimes is not going to be good at this job. Yeah. What's interesting too, is a lot of these guys, you know, who have, were doing both. So they were coaches and they were just working, you know, burning the midnight oil and fo and like getting all this data and analyzing the data and doing a great job. And now there are jobs where they're really just doing a lot of data and they're not coaching anymore. And I, you know, look, I can tell you from personal experience, once I sold the gym, I still train. I still train uh, five or six people on Wednesdays. And I have a, I had a hockey group for eight weeks uh, in the summer. I have two softball girls. So, I, you know, I kind of mix it up a little bit. It's, it's, but it's not the same as when I own the gym and I had a steady stream of people and different types types of um, uh, people coming in. It really isn't. Even though I am still training, I, you know, and I'm, you know, do my own stuff too, obviously, but, but it, it is different when you're not in there every single day. Cause if you're not working with a bunch of people, it can't just be a few, like, like really like I am, um, you know, you, you still, things come up, but at the same time, you don't get that well-rounded, oh, my knee hurts, my ankle hurts, this is what we're doing here, this isn't working, that's not working, um, and so you figure out that, you know, a lot of these guys that have done that, and they got, they got um, you know, uh, elevated to these positions, now aren't even coaching anymore. Oh, yeah, I, I mean, I think, and I don't know if a lot of, some of these guys that have gotten these kind of director of performance positions, I don't know how many of them actually coached. Ever. And that's what I think it's very, very interesting is there'll be I think there's gonna be a big run on PhDs and there'll be PhDs running departments and directing and doing all this stuff. And I don't know if that necessarily will be good for the field. I don't know if it will advance things the way that the the people in power will think that it will advance things. And that's as I said, that's what you see in business. I think that's why sometimes Big business is so amazingly inefficient because you have people doing jobs that they're not really qualified to do and supervising people that they don't really understand. I think if you're going to, I think it's really important if you're going to supervise someone that you've at some point done their job. I think that's why when you look at kind of management training programs, 
they'll put somebody through and they'll say, hey, you've got to work like in every job and every department. You've got to understand because it's really hard to deal. You know, if you're a Ph.D. in sports science or whatever and you come in and you've got to supervise a strength and conditioning coach who maybe has a, a master's degree in phys ed, you guys probably aren't going to hit it off. You guys might not see eye to eye on everything. So uh, I think – I think we're headed um, into some interesting times, I will say. And I might say we're headed into some rough times because we're seeing, even it's interesting now you see jobs posted in there's search firms handling the search for a job for a strength and conditioning coach or for a performance director or whatever it is. And I actually encourage our younger guys now to get, hey, get more geeky, get more involved in the data because – if you're not, it's going to hold you back. Down the road, you're going to be held back maybe five years, ten years from now. The fact that you're not a data guy and that you don't understand catapult and you don't understand the force plate and you don't understand some of these technological advances is going to be a problem for you down the road. It won't be enough to just be a good coach anymore. Yeah. I, I will say, though, uh, in in the defense of the director of performance, I like it when it turns out to be like Br- Brandon Marcello's um, uh, path to that, right? So he was strength coach. He was working for, for years as a strength coach, and then he was at Stanford, and then he made him director to kind of oversee because, again, that that the strength coaches in – were, were always a product of the football team, right? And so now that director right. took that away where, okay, now you got a football guy. So these football coaches get so – they get fired all the time. And then, you know, now every – now the rowers and the golfers and all the other, the other sports get affected by this just because the football team sucks. So, right. uh, you know, and they no, get and fired. I, I agree with someone like – I mean, Brandon's the perfect example of how it's supposed to work. Yeah. But – I think, you know, with without naming names and being impolite, I could cite other examples of how it's not supposed to work. You know, Bob Alejo is a really good example of how it's supposed to work. Yeah. You know, you look at a guy who ends up being the director, but who's really been an in-the-trenches strength and conditioning coach. But I, I feel like we're kind of trending away from that a little bit more towards these – it's sort of like if you've had a little bit of experience in the field and a lot of education, then you're more marketable versus someone who's had a lot of experience in the field and a little bit of education. Yeah. Because, because as I said, it's the, the, the management people, as a general rule of thumb, are I, – I, I, mean, I hate to use the term better educated, but the management people now, there's more and more management people – who are not coming from the ex-player route. Yeah. They're people, you know, if you look at particularly like, you know, in hockey, that it's going in that direction. In baseball, it's going in that direction, the kind of money ball direction where they're, hey, we're going to hire somebody really smart from Harvard or from Yale or, like I said, from Stanford or, you know, one of these Ivy League schools or those types of guys. And because they're really smart and they understand how to build an organization. But then when they start to build out into our area, they – they tend to gravitate towards someone who is more like them. So it's, we've gotten way off track here, by the way. Too. <laughs> no, no, I, but it is relevant. I think you're right, too. I think because, like, what you're saying is, like, we're, we're really talking about the future, uh, you know, what's happening. And in order for people to survive in this business, another thing is learning about leadership, learning about management. Because, like you just said, oh, guys, get, get with the geeky stuff, get with the data. Also, Take some management classes, like do some continuing education on leadership because you're going to, if you are that person, even if you've been a strength coach, let's just use, uh, like, let's say, let's say Bob, and I'm not saying this is, this happened with Bob, Bob Alejo is a in the trenches guy. Let's say he gets to a, a position like that. There might be a, a tendency not to delegate. And, and I'm really talking about myself, probably. This is what happened with myself. You know, and I'd want to get down there and kind of get into it, and I'd be overstepping and be like, wait, do what you do best. Lead these people and, you know, use your your, your experience and, and, and your wisdom the way it should be used instead of being on the floor all the time. But understand about leadership and management as well. I think that's another important piece to being – uh, a, a coach, a director in the future? I think it's a more important piece, to be honest, but I think it's the less appreciated piece. And it's really interesting. So um, I retweeted, Ryan Holiday had tweeted uh, 
uh, quote, it said, if you haven't read hundreds of books, you are functionally illiterate and you will be incompetent because your personal experiences aren't broad enough to sustain you, which was General James Mattis was actually the quote. But it's 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 that kind of stuff, like I said, in management classes and reading. And it's having this really broad based ability to deal with. Because, again, when you get into these, everybody's going to have director of performance at some point. As you, know, you look at how schools have expanded. When I started out. I was the strength coach at Boston University, and no one ever thought about the ideas of marrying the uh, sports medicine department and the strength and conditioning department, right? Yeah. Because, I mean, they were, you know, saying sports medicine was way ahead of us. They had five or six athletic trainers and graduate assistants, and we had one person. And, you know, there was no nutritionist. There was no sports psychologist. And now suddenly you've got huge athletic training departments and you've got huge strength and conditioning departments and you've got a nutrition department and you've got a sports psychology department and you've got to be able to get in and work with all of these people and create a system. You know, so I love people, you know, high performance as if, and somebody made the joke, do, uh, why is the opposite of high performance, low performance? Do so you think there are people out there trying to create a low performance program? <laughs> so, um, but there is, like you said, there's so much, you need to be a really good generalist right now in our field in terms of I think you need to understand injury management. I think you need to understand strength and conditioning. I think you need to understand nutrition. I think you need to understand psychology. I think you need to understand management. But now you've added on, you need to understand the data piece too in terms of at least the basics of how this stuff works. Absolutely. And, and if anybody doesn't believe you, read – Range by David Epstein, and uh, he not he talks about the athletic world. He talks about the science world. He talks about uh, the corporate world about being uh, a generalist and understanding more about uh, being more well rounded, like Mike Boyle, who likes ice cream and beer, and um, is and can put on a new floor. So exactly, and I'm in the process of reading Range right now, so that's good. All right, Coach. Um, another thing that you changed a little bit, you said we're going to, and you're going to talk about in the winter seminar, but and we'll, I, Bush next night or had just tweeted this too. plyometrics. Where did they go? What's happening? You know, did, did are like, I, and we're not Boyle guys are not seeing this cause you, you, you've been talking about this forever and you have your system and we know you talk about jump, jump, throw, uh, sprint. Uh, every session. Um, but have you seen this? Do you feel like people are getting away from plyometrics and what changes have you made to your plyos? Well, I don't, I didn't, I was kind of surprised by that when, when Boo said that in terms of where did plyometrics go? Because I mean, I guess, and we talked about this the other day in the staff meeting, we live in our own little MBSC bubble. So sometimes I, I do get taken by surprise by what people are doing. And but for us, from a plow standpoint, the biggest change that we've made is we were always sort of, okay, we're going to jump two legs to two legs. We're going to hop one leg to one leg. We're going to bound basically right to left. And that all seemed to make perfect sense to me. And then as we started to talk more about unilateral training with other people, people started asking questions like, well, why do you jump so much or why don't you hop more? And it's like, hmm. I don't really know. Probably the same reason I always give for everything because that's the way we've always done it. And we haven't changed our plyo progressions much. But so the one thing we actually still jump in terms of we will still hurdle jump and we will still box jump. But in terms of single leg bounding, so a right to right bound, but a side to side kind of thing, we've made it more 45 degree because we realize nobody ever actually hops directly laterally. Yet we spent a lot of time, okay, three hops to the right, three hops to the left. It was literally purely in the frontal plane. But when you started seeing foot plants and ACLs and things like that, you think, oh, it's really that kind of 45 degree landing. And so we'd always done 45 degree bounds right to left, but we hadn't really done 45 degree hops. So what we did is we just started putting our hurdles in a line. And then hopping, so a single leg, right leg only, right, right, you know, but on either side of the hurdle, but moving forward, following same progression, sticking our landings, all that stuff. And that was a really big change. And it, I always allude to what I call the duh moments in change where I, sometimes I look and think, why weren't we doing this a, a really long time ago? <laughs> yeah. But I guess 
and I, I always think, well, it's better to have the duh kind of moment than it is to not. And because if you don't have that moment, that means you've never made those changes. And I felt that way about sprinting. I look at sprinting now and I'm just thinking, God, how are we not doing this? And there's, this has been a really big year. And I might actually put that slide in, you know, a really big year for duh moments mm-hmm. or a really big two years. You know, when you start looking at um, the things that that you you look and think, wow, I can't believe we were doing that. Yeah. And for anybody that doesn't can't catch on like I can, Coach Ball right now is writing down the duh moment slide. He might even be putting yes, it in I right am. now. See, I so am putting I, it in right I, now. I know you like <laughs> book. Um, <laughs> Coach, um, so, um, yeah. I, so then I was thinking like, duh, that was my next question. How did, is it D-U-H? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I think it is. I think it's D-U-H, but uh, maybe it'll do a spell check on it. <laughs> Coach, um, let's finish up. There was a nice video on Chris Doyle and, uh, uh, and you know, like a lot of, it's funny. I'm more looking at the comments like, yeah, this is the way to do it. You know, he's. You don't have to be flashy. You don't have to uh, cut your shirts. You don't have to be doing jumping jacks on the side. Uh, you don't have to be following coaches around, pulling them off the sidelines. Like Everybody was talking more about the professional. He is the highest paid strength coach in our profession in, in college strength and conditioning. Um, I just wanted to go over your thoughts on that to finish this up. It's the end of the year talk. And I really want to bring up professionalism again because I think it is – you know, we talked about this before last couple episodes about just it's such an important piece. You know, what are the clothes you're wearing? You know, how are you talking to your clients? Uh, you know, the continuing ed you're taking, uh, being a professional, not dating clients, um, you know, uh, making sure you're, you're, you're speaking professionally, the, the, even the music, et cetera. Um, I, you know, look. Don't always be like Mike. Uh, somebody had said, uh, the, you know, something on Twitter about the flip flops jumping around. But at least if you can, at least if you can demonstrate. But I don't think it always pertains to everybody. I mean, if you put the time in, people, are, you know. But it's this first impression idea, and this, you know, when you're new in the field, you really have to focus on this professionalism idea. I just wanted you to kind of touch on uh, the Chris Doyle stuff and and professionalism. Well, I think, like to me. Chris really defines professionalism, and obviously I'm a big fan, and the, most everybody knows I was his college strength coach. We've been really good friends for, I mean, I, I don't even know how many years now, but probably 30, because, um, yeah, he's getting close to 50, and he might be 50 by now, and he would have been 18 as a freshman, so more than 30 years. And, uh, and I just love the fact that the highest paid guy in our field is not a dink. You know what I mean? He's like he's like a legit rock solid guy who, as I said, he, he married his college girlfriend. He raised three great kids in Iowa. He hasn't jumped around from job to job. They've been in Iowa for I think twenty years. He's got a kid playing for the team at Iowa. He's got a kid coaching on the staff at Iowa. He's got a, his other one is at Harvard. It's you know I mean it's pretty storybook. And for a lot of people, and I would look at it and say it's storybook and it should be textbook in terms of. If you look at it and think, okay, I want to be the highest paid guy in my field, it's like, well, then go do a really good job someplace. And if you go do a really good job for someplace, and luckily, Chris works for a great guy. Kirk Francis is a, is a, is a wonderful human being based on everything Chris has told me about him. But he's paid Chris like the valuable professional that he is, and so he gets paid the coordinator money. He gets paid you know, kind of what the offensive and defensive coordinators make. And Chris has raised the bar for our entire profession. And my biggest beef with the whole thing is that there are people who are upset about it. You know, like, why would you possibly be upset? You know, the, uh, it's the old rising tide raises all boats, right? Yeah. And you look at this and think, you should be freaking thrilled that Chris Doyle's making whatever, $700,000 a year, because suddenly – a strength coach can make seven hundred thousand dollars a year. It you know that's not crazy anymore, and I love that. I I mean, obviously, and it's funny because I think about this all the time. I can remember going um, working in the NHL, and it was really interesting. Every pro athlete that I know bitches about how much you know when they get old, they bitch about how much money the young guys make. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Every single one. 
and, and since since the since I've been since I started with the Bruins in the nineties, and and I look at it and I think you know Cam Neely made two million dollars a year at the top of his career. He was the best. Like he created the position of power forward. He redefined the position. I don't think he ever broke two million dollars. You know, maybe he signed a you know a four year eight million dollar deal or something like that, which is crazy. And now you look and guys are signing. You know, I don't even know what the you know the highest paid guy in the NHL is, but seventy, eighty million dollars. But I look at that and think it's the same people complaining about what their parents. Oh, my parents bought the house for twenty thousand in uh, in Westchester County. <laughs> You're like, yeah, they did in nineteen forty five or whatever. Right after <laughs> exactly. World War II. You know, but it's amazing. Everybody does it. Everybody bitches about money, and everybody complains. And you shouldn't complain. You should realize that. Hey, they, these inflationary things that are going on are really good. When I, I can remember having a conversation with Mike Wojcik when he was still at the Patriots and him saying something about, you know, wow, there's a couple of strength coaches that are making six figures, you know, six figures, yeah. like over a hundred grand. And that was a big deal at that time. Maybe this was 20 years ago that somebody broke six figures. Somebody's going to break seven figures in the next couple of years. And that's awesome. It's also too late for me. I could look at me. Oh man, you know, I could if I was still working with teams. You, know, you yeah. can't be that guy, right? Yeah. You just got to realize that. Hey, this is good, and it's great that these guys are making money, and and be happy. Don't worry, be happy, right? Is that that's the song? There you go. Instead of looking at it and thinking, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna piss and moan about this now because somebody's making. You know, I missed I missed the boat. I missed the gravy train. It's like whatever. Just be happy the gravy train got here. Yeah. No, I agree. Uh, it's funny. Uh, I was just kind of thought about this right now while you were saying that. But in the personal training industry, it really hasn't changed. It's about they're still making. I think Geraldine Cooper Smith was saying, uh, you know, she started in the early 90s at some of the big box gyms and making, you know, 10 bucks an hour on the floor. That's like pretty much what they're still paying. It's kind of ridiculous. So um, that, that didn't see you're that guy. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. No, guy. it hasn't changed. No, I'm <laughs> As I'm saying, it, it hasn't changed. It's that goddamn no, rock and no, roll no, music is what it is. That's right. The kids today. But, kids today, um, everybody does it. <laughs> but I look at it think it has changed. I mean, I can remember because it didn't even exist. The idea that someone would pay you to watch them exercise yeah, yeah. was an absurd thought when I was a kid. Like when I was coming up in the profession, the idea of – because it was per, corporate fitness – you know, you'd go to a corporation and the corporation would hire you to be the wellness coordinator and to kind of be in the weight room and to watch people and show them how to use the machines. The idea that someone would pay you $100 an hour to watch them exercise yeah. was nuts. Yeah. And now yeah. when you're looking at the same thing, if you look at I, I don't know what Ben Bruno's charging an hour out in California, but I'm going to bet you it's, it's north of 200 an hour. So – I think it is happening. Is it trickling down into the big box gym yet? No, and it may never. Yeah. Because the big box gyms, the reality is they don't care. Yeah. And there's no real incentive for them. But again, the the top, you know, people that are at the top of the personal training game, there's people now. I will, you know, I used to think it was a big deal to make six figures. And now, you know, I'll guarantee you there are people out there that are do, that are personal training, and you start thinking. I mean, $100 an hour if you worked a 40-hour week is 200000 a year if you were working for yourself, if you were an independent contractor trainer, right? Yep. You see, you know, I mean, so if you're making – if you're getting $200 an hour as an independent contractor trainer, you're making big money. Yeah, true. And uh, it's uh, – you know, again, I don't know if that's trickling down. Those are like the celebrity client, not the two hundred dollars. Like Don Saldino's making over five hundred an hour, but um, but that's you know totally different. Um, again, Ben Bruno, you know, he's he's working with celebrities, so it's a little different. But yeah, it's uh, it's interesting to see where it's all going. But coach, thanks for coming on and spending a little extra time with us for the end of the year episode. Uh, we really appreciate appreciate it, and uh, wish you a happy new year. I I just have to tell you though, Ant. I just downloaded uh, a uh, a dumb and dumber picture from my duh slide. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it is my favorite. We're talking about it's my favorite line from the movie when they're uh, they're Jeff Bridges is driving and the cops trying to pull him over, and he's screaming at him, "Pull over, pull over!" Mm -hmm. And Bridges looks at him and says, 
thank you very much, but it's a cardigan. And I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> nice. You might have to do a little video for that segment, so... There you go. Oh, God. I love Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> All right, Coach. Well, thanks for doing this. All right, Ian. Thanks. Have If I don't talk to you, I have a Merry Christmas. And everybody that's listening, hope you have a great holiday season, whatever a holiday it is you're uh, celebrating. All right, that's going to do for episode 272 of the Shrink Coach Podcast. Remember, you can try shrinkcoach.com out for three days just a bucket of access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best forum on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every single day to access that offer. Go to shrinkcoach.com, click the Join Now button to get started on your trial. Special thanks to Chris Parry and the folks over at Perform Better. Remember, there's still time for the huge holiday sale, up to 30% off and free shipping on select items. They got sandbags, FMS kits, TRX, all kinds of rollers, kettlebells, dumbbells, and so much more. Also, the one-day seminars start January 11th in Fairlawn, New Jersey. You can check out performbetter.com for all their products and info on their educational seminars. Thanks to Coach Boyle for spending a little extra time with us today and for sharing his insights and philosophies into the world of strength, conditioning, and performance enhancement. Also, like to thank Train Heroic, Results Fitness University, and Functional Movement Systems for being our partners again this year. My name's Anthony Renna. My new book, Be Like the Best, is at BeLikeTheBest.com or ContinueFit.com. Remember, the book consists of 50 interviews with top fitness pros, and after each interview is a Be Like, which is just an action step or a challenge that'll help you be like the best. You can go to BeLikeTheBest.com for more information or ContinueFit.com. That's going to do it for now. Have a happy new year, and I'll speak to you next time.